So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. I was going to say awesome because already I know it's going to be awesome. It's like the number one request of webinar that people request. Today we're talking about grant readiness and we're hoping that you learn how your grant application can stand out from the competition. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here. I'm just going to take 30 seconds to show you how you can engage today. Um, if you need the CC for the closed caption, just type it at the bottom of your screen, CC. You know that you're going to get the recording. If you have been on our webinars, you're going to get the recording and the video slides. And what else? Oh, there's a special link I'm going to send to you probably by tomorrow. If you have a question, please type in the Q&A. We have lots of people here, probably, well, it's hundreds of people that's going to be here today. So it's best if you type your question in the Q&A so that way the speaker's team can um, grab the questions and answer them at the end. And there's going to be a survey. So if you have to leave early, it's going to pop up on your screen. We would love your feedback so we can get some more insights on what you'd like to hear. I'm going to turn this over to Lorinda Santana from Remy Consulting. And I'm she's going to tell you more about herself. So Remy, I mean, Lorinda, Remy, that's your business name. Lorinda, right, right. Thank you, and thank you for being here with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. Let me go ahead and start presenting. Can we see the screen? Not yet. Let me share screen really quickly. So glad to have everybody here. Let's go ahead and open this up. And... Ooh. Give me one second. I keep problems. Here we go. Awesome. So thank you so much for your patience. I'm very excited to have everybody here today. So today's workshop, can everybody see the presentation? Is it popping up correctly? Yep, looks good. Awesome, awesome. So let's get right into it. So hello everyone, my name is Lorinda Santana. Um, I'm the owner of Remy's Consulting. Today I'm gonna be the lead presenter in our workshop. So joining me today are two team members. We have Paola, who's one of our project managers. And we have Israel, who's one of our technical specialists. They're gonna serve as moderators. I'm very, very open to answering any questions you may have. So please feel free to ask anything you would like and go ahead and, and as mentioned before, put your question in the chat box. That way our team can answer. So during the presentation, Paola and Israel will answer as much as they can. And then anything that's a little bit more technical, I'll go ahead and answer towards the end of the presentation. We should have about 15 minutes or so at the end to answer any questions you may have. So to get us started, I'm gonna give you a very brief background on myself. I've been in the grant funding sector for about 15 years now, which has led to around $25 million in funding for nonprofit organizations here in the US, as well as in Latin America. I've had a chance to work with very large multinational organizations, as well as many small grassroots nonprofits. And believe it or not, they all struggle with the same thing. Now, what is that? What is what that struggle is? So there's this common misconception that to get grant funding, all you need to do is draft a perfect proposal, send it out, and boom, the money flies in through the door. However, the reality is that to get grant funding, there are over 30 checkpoints that funders are looking for in qualified applicants that goes way beyond solely drafting that strong proposal. So in today's presentation, I wanna give you a clear look into the grant funding industry, as well as provide you access to what funders are really looking for so that you can get those grants. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start with our grant funding landscape. So there are three primary funders um, that we're gonna look at. The first, the biggest funder that exists in the United States is our government, so our federal government. The federal government has 26 different federal grant making agencies that provide different types of grants. In total, they award about $1.1 trillion per year in funds. So this is a lot of money. Now, the majority of this money does go to state programs such as Medicaid, but there's another $500 billion approximately that does go to nonprofit organizations and select for profits that are working in the community. What's really interesting about the government and what's important to understand here is that they have a trickle down effect. So what that means is that the federal government many times will fund state programs and in many of the local funds that we can access actually come from the federal government. So those are our big fish. However, outside of government grants, we also have the private industry. This was a, a graph that I found online um, that helps to show that in within a three year, this was a study that was done over a three year period, 
charitable organizations receive $2.5 trillion in grant funds. And you can see here how it's broken down. $442 billion went to 501Cs, $108 billion went to advocacy, et cetera. So there's a lot of funding, even in the private sector, if you're not very interested in the federal government for the moment, um, that's available for nonprofit organizations. Now we get into corporate. Corporate is our third bucket of funders. So corporations provide different types of funds. They provide traditional grants, which is what you would see like the application you have to fill out and submit. They also provide one-time gifts, sponsorships for events, in-kind services or goods, as well as volunteer hours. So there's many corporations that can work with a nonprofit and then provide their staff as volunteers. And that's also like a donation to your nonprofit. So this is an interesting statistic that I found. There was actually $21.08 billion given by corporations in 2022, which was an increase since 2021 of 3.4%. So what's the purpose of all this I'm showing this to you is to show you that there are trillions of dollars available and rising when it's related to grant funds. There's a lot of money out there. So now the key is how do we get that? How do we access this funding for our programs and services? So let's take a quick poll. I would love to ask you a few questions and we can pop that poll up. The question is this, what is your honest opinion? What do you consider the most crucial factor for a charity to secure grant funding? Is it an excellent grant writer, a grant writer with connections, efficient inter-office processes, team, manage team time management and organization of documents, or relationship with funders? Please go ahead and choose which one you think is correct. We'll take a minute there. Everybody go ahead and put in your, your answers. Awesome. So here's our results. So we have 21% say that it's an excellent grant writer, 10% a grant writer with connections, 37% efficient inter-office processes, team time management, organization of documents, and the majority voted for relationships with funders, i.e. board members and director of connections. Excellent. So now let's get into a little more information. I'm not going to reveal what the answer is quite yet, but I want you to remember what you what you chose. Let's see what, what it says here. So let's go through challenges to accessing funding. So I'm a very much of a research nerd. I like to read a lot of different, different research studies, information that's out there related to the grant funding field to understand where the challenges are happening so that we can then provide solutions. So what we found is there was a double study that was done on both sides of the actual applicants, so the, the nonprofits applying for the grants, in comparison to the foundations and the funders that are providing uh, the funding availability to see what's going on. And what we found was that 80%, according to this study, 80% of the, of the challenge related to funding is inefficient processes. Now, what does this mean? Inefficient processes has to do with the internal process, the way that the nonprofit organization is applying for the grant, the way that they are collecting information, the way they are gathering documents, the way they're communicating within departments, et cetera. It's what's going on inside the office. That's 80% of the reason the organizations do not have access to grant funds. Number two, because administrative tasks and preparation of documents is not happening, in a fluid way, 66% are reporting that there's a lot of time wasted on administrative tasks. There's also an overwhelm with communication. So that's also interior office communications between departments, between other funders, et cetera. That becomes a major challenge. And there's also some difficulty reporting results. So whenever you're applying to a grant, um, you have to report the results. You have to say what you expect in the front end, what you expect to do with the application. So let's say, you receive the grant funding, what objectives, what goals do you have? Um, and being able to report those results is also a major issue. And then finally, struggling with the quality or the quantity of applications. Many times funders are seeing that they're receiving applications with great programs, but the quality um, is not good enough. Or the quantity, you may have an organization that says, we need a lot of money, we need to apply to all these grants, but because they're kind of doing everything on the fly and not really preparing correctly, the quality of the application is not good enough. So this is one of, these are some of the major issues with accessing to funding. 
So now let's go through some real stories. These are two case studies that I want to share with you that I'm going to read out. And these are true stories. I've changed a lot of the information for the client confidentiality purposes, but these are actual real life situations that were clients that I worked with. So we have clients, A, are educational superstars. So early in my career, I had the privilege of working with client A. This was a newly established nonprofit dedicated to fostering youth in South Florida. The founders, a compassionate husband and wife team, were driven by a personal connection to the cause. The wife had been a foster child herself. They established the organization with a clear mission to provide support and opportunities for foster children. When I joined them, my role was to conduct funder research. I quickly discovered that despite their early stage, the organization was remarkably well organized. They had meticulously documented all their program information and ingeniously created their own online grant framework. The system not only facilitated easy access to necessary documents, but also streamlined the entire research process. Interestingly, the founders had never hired a professional grant writer. They were only mid-level writers themselves, yet their effective communication and robust management of grant documentation were exemplary. These strengths played a crucial role in the nonprofit's rapid expansion. In just their first year, they grew beyond the state, establishing a presence in three separate states. Today, the reach extends across all 50 states in the United States. From an initial budget of under $100,000, they now boast an annual budget exceeding $5 million. More importantly, what began as a small initiative serving only a handful of students has blossomed into a significant operation that regularly supports thousands of foster youth. That's our client A. Now let's talk about client B, our healthcare change makers. A few years later, so after I started working with client A, I had the opportunity to work with client B. This is a nonprofit that had built a reputable presence for over two decades. So over 20 years, they were in existence. Their focus was on providing services to low-income elderly adults, and they owned a substantial facility that catered to this demographic. My task was to assist them in securing grant funding for an ambitious project to expand their building to include services for individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia. Although Client B had identified specific funders to target, they had been unsuccessful in securing the necessary awards. One of my initial responsibilities was to join a conference call with a funder who had recently rejected their application, which was drafted by a professional grant writer. The funder was forthright, explaining that the rejection was due to a misreading of the funding criteria, which explicitly outlines their ineligibility. This was a humbling moment for the nonprofit, but it underscored the need for a more strategic approach moving forward. Now here's where it gets really interesting. In our pursuit of alternative opportunities, we connected with a foundation whose president had a personal connection to Alzheimer's, having recently lost her mother to the disease. The foundation had allocated $1 million to support Alzheimer's services and was enthusiastic about our project. The interest peaked further after a site visit, which went exceptionally well, setting the stage for a potential grant. However, the process stumbled at a critical point. The foundation requested several essential documents to finalize the funding, but to our dismay, client B was unable to produce them. Despite frantic efforts to locate the necessary paperwork, the disorganization proved too great an obstacle. Ultimately, the frustration and inability to organize their documents led them to forfeit the $1 million grant. Terrible. It still pains me, this story. So now let's look at this a little bit. Let's look at a comparison between client A and client B. So client A, what were the factors that led them to success? They had strong organizational systems and documentation. They had clear communication within their team, and they were also self-sufficient. What I mean by self-sufficient is that they did the work within their organization, within their office, and they were able to get all the documentation that's required for grants ready. So when they did bring a person in to draft the applications for them, they had everything they need to do the job. So now if we look at um, client B, what are, what are the factors that contributed to their failure? We have a misunderstanding of funding criteria, poor documentation practices, and unfortunately, inadequate responses to the challenges that they faced. So client A succeeded due to excellent organizational skills and document management, like I mentioned, effective communication, and the ability to efficiently scale their operations. 
These strengths enable them to expand rapidly and manage funding opportunities effectively, even without professional grant writers on staff. Client B, on the other hand, struggled due to poor documentation practices and a lack of understanding of funding criteria. The organizational disarray led them to a missed opportunity to secure a significant grant, demonstrating the critical impact of robust administrative systems and a need to adapt quickly to challenges in the nonprofit management. The success of client A and the unfortunate failure of client B underline the importance of thorough preparation, effective internal communication, and meticulous document management in the nonprofit sector, specifically when we're applying for grants. So now the question is, who will you be? My hope is that after today's presentation, we still have another half to go, um, good amount to go, but I hope that you can see the difference between the nonprofit organization that was well-prepared and the nonprofit organization that was not well-prepared and how that really made a difference on both sides. From a personal level, working with both these organizations was incredible because I was able to learn a lot from both of them. Both of them were very early on in my career. And I saw that regardless of the size of the organization, whether you're small or whether you're large, really making sure that you're prepared and you have everything in order that's needed for you to apply for grants is really what's most important. Also team communication, working collaboration, prepping your documentation, those type of things helps you to make sure that you're strong and you have what you need together to be able to sit down and apply to those grants. So now let's go into the funder's lens. This specific section, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the funder's perspective. So in my career, I've had an opportunity to work as a funder myself, work on the funder side. Specifically, I spent about a year in Washington, DC, and I was able to learn the ins and outs regarding um, how the federal systems work. I took some classes over there. It was very, very interesting work to see how they're funding different grant programs. And we also have other individuals on our team who have as well worked on the side of the funders. So there's three specific points we're gonna talk about. One is the concept of scoring proposals. Number two is the funders checklist. So this is in essence um, what the funders are looking for, kind of like an internal checklist a lot of them will use to make their decisions regarding who receives grants and who does not, and then our checkpoint list. So let's start with scoring proposals. When an organization applies for a grant, this is something that's not, not everybody understands. You may present your proposal to a, to a funder and you may say, okay, here's a proposal. The funder knows what we wanna do. We're in alignment. Our ideas are in alignment. We both want to fight for the same thing, right? We both have the programs and we wanna do the same thing in a community, resolve these things in a community. However, what's interesting is that many times, even though the board members or your grant manager may give the final okay on the grant application, there's a whole nother group of individuals that serve as reviewers that are grading or reviewing proposal, your proposal, and they may not have anything to do with the funder. Um, many times in order to eliminate bias, funders will actually look for external reviewers that are then brought into the organization to review the grant. So it's not somebody that's on staff. That's something that's very interesting. Um, so in essence, your audience, you may be drafting your proposal and communicating specifically to a funder, but the reality is that grant manager may not be the person that's reviewing your grant application. They may make, they may be the ones that approve it towards the end, but in the beginning, it's not, it's gonna be external reviewers. So your reviewers many times are not experts and may have never even read a proposal before. Now, depending on who the funder is, they're gonna choose reviewers that have some kind of knowledge in the field. So for example, if it's an educational grant, they may choose teachers. If it's something in the criminal justice system, they may choose a police officer but a lot of them have not ever done grant reviews before. They tend to be very much open call. So it's important to understand as you're drafting the proposal, you need to explain in a way that just about anybody would understand that we don't wanna use really technical information. We wanna make sure everything is clearly communicated and written correctly. That way they can understand it because they may not be experts in your field. So again, so if they're not experts, and these reviewers are external individuals brought in to score a grant. How does it work? What do they do? Well, what they use is a scorecard. So the scorecard is, in essence, they'll have certain points that have been predetermined before the actual um, final review of the application happens. And these predetermined points are going to have, are going to provide you with the score. So you're going to get a certain number of points per section. Once you have received enough points, then you would basically move on to the next phase. The federal government does this 
There's many foundations that do this as well, um, but it's basically a scorecard. And then you have to get enough points. Once you get enough points, you get to move on to the next stage. That's more or less how a lot of grants are reviewed. Another thing that I think is really important to talk about is the checklist. So funders are not just looking to make sure you get all those points. They're also looking for a lot of other things. For example, they're wanting to make sure that you followed all the directions that were asked of you. So if your application, if in the application it says that all of the documents that are uploaded need to be in PDF, that means they need to be in PDF, not in Word. Um, if it says that you need to have a certain typography or a certain type of description, or you need to answer questions in a certain way, that's what you need to do. And this is an area where a lot of organizations will miss opportunities because they simply do not follow directions. Um, and it's not intentional it's because it can be a very stressful process and overwhelming, but that's one of the first things they look, did you follow directions or not? Number two, they look at whether or not documents are readable and again, uploaded correctly. There are many times where different types of attachments are required. Again, it could be a PDF, it could be a Word document, it could be an Excel spreadsheet. And when we're talking about an application you're submitting online, many times you have to upload that document into a portal and they wanna make sure that the document is readable and uploaded correctly. And if it's not, you may just, just because of that, you may get bumped out of the opportunity of receiving this grant. The, another part that's very important is when you're uploading a grant application into a portal, there may be multiple sections you need to upload. For example, you need to upload your budget into one section, your written narrative into another, attachments into another. Are you uploading the documents into the correct section or not? If you are, great. But if you are not, let's say you uploaded your budget into your narrative section, that, that tiny mistake there alone does lead to an application being denied. So that's another thing that funders are looking for. Next we have applications provide only what is requested. Sometimes organizations want to um, provide more information than what's requested. In some circumstances, that's okay, but in many circumstances, it's not. You wanna make sure that you are only providing the information that's requested, nothing more. Also, file names, are your file names correct? There are many grants as well that will require that the file names match what they're asking for in the RFP, which is in the instructions of the grant. If they do not match, that's another reason they can bump out your application. Next, we have documents that easily represent the organization's management processes and flow. So remember, many times you don't know the foundation, you've never met them, or they don't know who you are, and they have many, many, many applications to go through. When they're looking at your application package, this is all of your attachments, your narrative, your budget, everything that's being submitted, they wanna be able to see that your organization is well managed. They wanna understand how your processes work and how the overall flow and communication of your organization works. So on paper, you wanna be able to articulate to them that your organization is well managed, well structured and functions, right? So if you notice all of these bullets, these are I believe one, two, three, four, six bullets have nothing to do with the narrative. These are, this is 60% of this checklist that has to do with organization, document management, and basically following directions. These are some of the main things that funders are looking for. Aside from that, now we can get into a little bit more information regarding programs and services. Are you articulating your programs and services correctly? Is the data and statistics that you're providing supportive? Does it help to show your case and to show the need in your community? Does your budget, the numbers, and your narrative, the written word regarding your program, does it match? This is another area that organizations make big mistakes. The numbers have to tell a story, the same story that your narrative has to tell. Does it match or does it not? And then finally, your narrative, when you're answering your narrative, so these are the questions in essence that a grant application is asking you, right? Did you have to fill out? Do, do the answers, are your answers correct? And are they clear? Are you writing in a way that a person can understand it simply? So sometimes you have to take yourself out of the program, kind of look at your program and your services from an external perspective, and that's gonna help you make sure that your information makes sense to your other reader. Because like I mentioned before, we don't know who your other reader may be. It may be a grant manager, or it may be somebody that's been hired specifically for the purposes of reviewing your grant application. So now let's get into funder checkpoints. This is really interesting. So we found, and this is this is a study that we've done internally that I've done over most of my career to see what is the general information that funders are asking? What type of information are they wanting to see in applications? So what we found is there are 10 key points of information that grant funders are looking for. 
Some may only look for a portion of these, some may look for all of it, but these are the 10 key points of information that you need to have ready. We always recommend from the beginning, ready to go before you actually start applying to the application. Now, the other thing that's important about this checklist before we go through it is if you as a nonprofit organization can gather all this information and have it ready, and then you contract out a grant writer or you even yourself as a grant writer, or if it's a volunteer, and you can provide this information to that person, that person will be able to do so much of a better job for you because they will have to be in the rat race of chasing you down for different documents. This is something that we recommend that organizations do in advance, get all this information gathered together, and then use that information to sit down and apply to the grant applications. This will help streamline your process and make it so much more enjoyable. So let's go through these checkpoints. So first off, we have organizational documents. These are documents related to the organization, related to your nonprofit, your 501c3 letter, your bylaws, all those legal documents that you have when you first started your nonprofit, that would be the first group of documents you would need to have ready. Number two, you have legal documentation, similar to organizational documents, but more of the legality, the legal structure of your organization. Third, you're going to have financial documentation. These are your budgets, your organizational budgets, operational budgets, et cetera, your 990s that you would submit at the end of the year, and if you're large enough, an audit and financial statement. Then you're going to have another group of documents related to your programs and services. So this is where a lot of the narrative is pulled from. Um, you want to have all that information already detailed before you start writing the grant application. Sure, when you sit in front of the application, there are changes that will be made. You want to adapt it to the one you're applying to, but you should already have a very clear idea as far as what your programs and services are before you apply to a grant application. Next, we have population and demographics. This is a really big piece of a grant application as well. There's different types of demographic information, population information, statistics that you can gather. It's really important to gather as much as you can to prove not only who it is that you're serving, but what their needs are in the population and what the problem is that you're working towards resolving. This is something that really strengthens your application. And getting this, gathering all this information in advance is really going to help you help your process quite a bit. Then we have in-kind. So in-kind has to do with anything that you're receiving that's being donated to you. It also includes a documentation of your time. Let's say this is your organization, you've started this organization, you're donating your time, you're not receiving any kind of compensation at this point. That is also an in-kind service that is being provided to your nonprofit. And all of the in-kind services and also goods and items that you receive has a monetary value. So we recommend that you calculate that and that's have that information ready so that you can show the funder that, hey, listen, we have 100 hours a week of volunteer hours. We have you know, space that's being donated to us because that shows that other individuals, other organizations support what you're doing and your organization is much stronger presented that way. Also, we have funding historical data. So anything that you have received in the past, you also want to have copies of that available. Um, if this is your first grant, you may not have a lot of funding historical data, but if you've applied to the funds in the past, you've received donations before, you've had partnership relationships, all that type of information we want to have listed or have available in the beginning of applying to a grant. Also outside support and partners. So you know how it is in the nonprofit world. What I love about it is that we all work in partnership. So there may be another organization you work with, a government entity, another nonprofit, a school, et cetera. Who are your partners? What other organizations are you collaborating with? That type of information is really important to have available as well. So when you sit in front of the computer and start doing grant application or you bring in a, a grant writer, they have that information to start filling out that those forms for you. Next, we have media. Media is a really important piece because nowadays everybody is involved in the media. So we're using social media, you know, our Facebook, our Instagram, our websites, videos, all of it is really important and really popular because it helps to give a visual depiction of the great work that you're doing. So anything you have related to the media it could be an article that was written about you, um, again, it could be Instagram posts, it could be videos of your, of your team activities, anything like that is important to have. And again, these are the type of things that we want to have available and ready before we actually sit down and apply to the grant application, because that way it's easy to pull all these pieces of information to build that application and submit a strong application to your funder. And then lastly, we have evaluation methods. So whenever you are applying to a grant, the idea is that there's some kind of a problem in the community that you are working towards resolving. 
So that problem can be, let's say, um, lower literacy rates in a certain community, or it could be another program we recently worked on was a spay and neuter program um, for animals in a, in a community that the pet parents were not able to afford to spay and neuter their pets. And so this clinic, this nonprofit clinic, created a program to then spay and neuter the pets for free. So those are different issues that are in this part in society that our nonprofits are resolving. So, but in order to know whether or not your program is successful, you have to have evaluation methods in place. Evaluation is its own topic of itself, but there's ways to show what was going on before the program started and how the improvements were calculated after. So it could be pre and post surveys, it could be anecdotal stories. There's lots of different ways to provide this information, but the data and the evaluation methods that you're using is super essential. And that's something you want to decide on before you apply to a grant. So that way you have all of that in order. And as your programs are running, you can start to collect that data to be able to then report that your program was successful or not. So now that we looked a little bit at what the different funder perspectives are, what the different, you know, the different information that's available to you, how to prep your application, let's talk a little bit about steps for success. Now that we know what funders are looking for, let's talk about some steps for success. So here's a couple of takeaways. So after being in the field of takeaways, generally speaking, that I've that I've learned over my career. Number one, after being in the field for over 15 years, we found that there is a huge gap between charities who apply for grants and those that actually get them. Regardless of your size, regardless of your staff size, and regardless of your income, all charities who struggle with grants, they all have the same issues. So this issue is the same across the board with big and small charities, again, struggling with the same problem. So the reason I repeat this, because I think it's really important to understand, and again, this is from our perspective with working with hundreds of nonprofits, is that is that there's a misconception that if you're a large nonprofit, you're automatically going to get more grants. And if you're a small one, that's not really true. What happens is that both large and small struggle with a lot of these same problems that we found are, number one, that grants are typically treated as last minute or on the fly activities, right? Unfortunately, organizations tend to apply to grants when they're desperate for money, when funds are low, when things aren't going well for them, that's when they want to jump into the grant world. And that's okay, but at the same time, organizations are more successful when they start grant activity activities as early as possible. They start preparing themselves to apply to grants and they have regular activities. So they do things on the regular, which is researching grant opportunities, um, updating their paperwork, creating partnerships with, or with organizations, et cetera. Doing these activities on a regular basis is what helps them to be more consistent with their activities internally, which will externally help them to be more receive more consistent funding. Um, so that's something that's very important. Number two, there's no unified method or process in place to apply for grants. So many times organizations will say, okay, here's an application. I just need to file the application and submit it. But again, and I hope that through the presentation, we've we've seen that there's a lot of other things that are involved. There's a lot of documentation that needs to be developed in advance. There's information that needs to be collected and gathered. And there you should have some kind of a process in place within your organization on how to do this that is as stress-free as possible and that consists of consistent activities. You know, this month we're going to research grant opportunities. The next step is we're going to review our programs and services. We're going to find the good matches. We're going to apply with ample time, et cetera. There should be a process that's put into place to help you apply to these grants. And thirdly, ineffective communication between team members is very common. I've seen it many, many times, and this happens a lot also with the large organizations, that sometimes we are so focused on the funding or focused on the money that we need to keep our programs going that we may miss sight of our mission. We may miss sight of listening to our, our program managers or our team members and we may kind of be disconnected, right? Like I've seen this happen very, very often. The organizations are disconnected. One group, you know, one part of the organization may say, okay, we need to go after this fund. And the other one may say, no, that's really not what's important. This other idea is more important. So really having good communication, working with your team is absolutely essential. So with all of this, and seeing all this data and working in this field for quite some time, what we did was we developed something that we call the GRR, which is in essence the Grant Readiness Review. 
that provides two key supports to nonprofits. So the first thing that it provides is a grant funding based framework that includes guides, videos, audio, and different templates to help charities understand and create the quality documents that funders are looking for. Because remember I mentioned before, there's those 10 different breakdown of documents, 10 different checkpoints. Um, each one of them has a different group of documents that need to be drafted before you actually apply to a grant. And then that information is what you use to apply to the grant application. So the GR in essence provides that framework and also resources to build out those documents. Number two, it also, the second part of the GRR is that it does provide a professional review of those documents by our team. And it's gonna give you real feedback on areas of improvement to help you save time and energy to make sure that you're grant ready because it can be really stressful to just jump into a grant application, start applying, put all this time and effort into it and then you don't get the funding. That's a really stressful situation that happens to all nonprofits. So what we like to really encourage is that you start doing all that prep work in advance to make sure that you're ready before you start getting into those grant activities. So these two parts of the GRR help to tackle the issues that we see with um, charities lacking grant funds. So a couple of benefits to the GRR and a benefit to the process, not just the GRR that we provide, but just the idea, the concept of working on documents in advance and getting yourself grant ready. Um, these are some of the benefits. Number one, it provides access to grant activity framework based on funder checkpoints. I think it's that's this is a missed a missed perspective that a lot of nonprofits have is that when you're applying to a grant, you're you're there to convince, and I mean that in a positive way, but to convince in a positive way the funder to fund your project. So you're not writing the application for yourself. You're writing the application or drafting the application for the funder. So it's really important to understand what the funder is looking for and make sure that you're answering the questions that are being asked. Um, with this, specifically with the GRR, there are guides and templates to help charities create all these different documents that funders are looking for. Because things like, let's say, a flow chart of your team members, um, a flow chart of your programs and services, resumes of board of directors, all these type of things are documents that we find that are very common in different applications that, again, it's much easier to prepare in advance versus doing it when you have a grant you know, deadline in a week. So that's something else that the GRR does help with. Um, there's also a separate part of this where it's a process that provides personalized feedback on areas of improvement for grant applications. Whether you're working with us, you're working with someone else, it's really great to have somebody else reviewing your documentation. It can be a volunteer, it can be a board member to see if they're understanding everything and if everything looks complete. Because when you're on the computer and you're drafting these applications, it's very easy to think that you are describing everything correctly, but when another person externally reviews it, that's when you catch a lot of different errors and things like that. Another thing about the GRR and prepping in general for grant applications in advance is that it's gonna help support your grant writer, whether that's somebody on your team, whether that's somebody you bring in externally, having a grant writer, they, they do, I mean, I'm a grant writer myself, right? Like I've been doing this for a long time. My best clients have always been the ones that come to me prepared that can provide me demographics, statistics, information on their programs, information on their services. Um, they can tell me their story, how the nonprofit began, where they've gone, and they can provide all this information to me. Then I can use all that information, learn the nonprofit, learn what the funder is looking for, and create a fantastic proposal. So this, these methods really are going to help your not only your organization, but also help whoever it is your, your grant writer may be to save them time and in essence save you money because then they spend less time developing these documents. Let them focus just on the drafting and the submitting of the proposals. And then finally, this helps to show firsthand the real process to applying for grants, demystifying the process. So when it comes to the, this is more of a GRR specific thing. When you go through the GRR, you go through our process, it's very much mimicked to what the funders do. Um, so you're gonna submit documents just like the funders will request. We're gonna create documents. You're gonna review them with a scorecard. We go through that whole process exactly the way that the funders do as close to it as possible. So that way you can have an understanding and idea of what this looks like. So that once you do apply for a grant, you're a little bit more prepared. So what I'm really excited about is we have a fantastic partnership or collaboration with TechSoup. Um, TechSoup and Remy's Consulting, we have a very a shared vision of supporting charities in their goal of acquiring consistent grant funds for their projects and programs. Um, this partnership is very exciting to us because it's an opportunity for us to expand the reach of the GRR 
and give charities access to a proven framework that does help organizations become 80% grant ready. Um, by giving charities an insider view of what funders are looking for, along with guides, templates, and the professional review of documents by our funding risk specialist, really is going to help charities go through the GRR to become significantly more qualified to apply to the grant funds. But regardless of whether or not you're working with us for the GRR or you're working on this on your own, I hope that you understand the importance of prepping and getting yourself ready within your organization before you apply to your grant opportunities, because that's going to help you become stronger along the way. So now let's go to the Q&A. I see we had 96 comments in the, in the chat. So let's see. So if there are any questions, feel free. I see one here. Cindy said, even the most organized of us face the same odds, maybe one in 10 receiving funding. Grants are highly competitive, but I get that we don't want to lose out because of lack of organization. Um, uh, very discouraging. I would like to know where the data comes from and does it apply to all grants? So it is, it, it's very difficult. There's definitely a very competitive edge when it comes to the grants and as far as what's available. Um, there is more applications you submit, more, more likely you are to obviously receive funding, right? Because there is a part of it that's a numbers game. But coming from the perspective of the work that we do, what we do is the, our clients go through, again, this organizational process from the beginning, and they're able to apply for more grants faster. So I think what happens is a lot of time that gets lost, um, you know, trying to draft new narrative and try to get things together and, and update documents that aren't always available. Getting all those things together can sometimes, you know, waste a lot of time. I don't mean to say it that way, but it can waste a lot of time for nonprofits. So I think the, the idea is that you, if you can get yourself ready and have all this stuff together, once your grant writer comes in, you can say, boom, here's everything that we can move forward. And you are more likely to apply to a lot more grant opportunities. Uh, Brandy, how do I ensure I'm in touch with a real grant writer? Do they have any credentials so I don't get scammed? Fantastic question. Seems like a Facebook group. So there are different certifying organizations that um, you can look into. So you have the American Grant Writers Association. They're the only organization in the U.S. that can certify actual certified grant writers. Um, that's one place to look. There's also, um, I think it's GPA, I believe is another organization that provides a lot of certification. So anybody that's, you know, I would look into what is their continuing education Right? Are they in the field of grant writing? Um, are they learning new, new things? Because the grant writing field is changing all the time. So I think it's really important to see what the organization is doing um, and make sure they're continuing their education and they're, they're actively involved in the field. Also a grant writer that has an online presence or that you know, right? I think is important because I've heard of a lot of scams as well. It's really sad. But usually those are individuals that don't really have a lot of presence, like look them up, you know, get references, things like that is going to help quite a bit. Lorinda, we have a couple of uh, asks in the chat about a AI and how AI can potentially support grant funding. Maybe you could address any concerns around that emerging technology in this arena too. Great question. So I've actually, I was very interested to see how AI works with the grant world. So I started playing with it myself. I think it's it's all based on what you ask, right? So AI is good in that it will help draft answers to different questions, which is great, but it's also really based on how well you're asking those questions. And what I will say is that, and again, I've used it multiple times, like kind of like as a test to see how good it answers or not. I don't think it will ever come to the point where it'll completely take over the grant writers because the thing is that you need to be able to communicate to your funder effectively. You need to be a little bit on the creative side, depending again on who your funder is. So I think it's a great tool to save you time and to get, let's say, 50% of your ideas out there well-written. So it definitely helps advance it, but I would not use it to say, okay, AI, go ahead and draft my whole proposal and submit it because it's very easy for somebody on the funder side to know that it's been drafted by a computer. So it's definitely a really great administrative tool. Um, it speeds up the process, but it's also again going to be based on the information that you feed to it. Let's see what we got. 
Oh, we got a lot of questions. We do have a lot of other questions, uh, which is so wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of forward some of those to you right now, Lorenda. Okay, uh, so one of the questions right now is if you're just starting out with grant writing, do you suggest, recommend um, going ahead and reading grants to understand the language before even applying? Yes, I think it's a great idea. I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea. If you can get a hold of proposals, um, I think it's a great idea to read those. I think it's also a great idea to go to the funders' websites look to see what their initiatives are that they're explaining. Also, if they happen to have, this is a really great tip. If you go to a funder, it's there's a funder you're looking for, and you can see who they've awarded in the past, go to their websites, look at their programs and services. So start doing some back-end investigation to see what type of programs are actually being funded and what type of communications those nonprofits that already had already have been awarded are, are providing. So that's some really great ways to get used to kind of the lingo, so to speak, in the grant world. Awesome, thank you so much, Lorinda. Um, so another question that we were asked a little bit earlier was, is it better to file our IRS 990 than 990EZ to qualify for more grants? Is there a difference there when it comes to those two types of forms or do um, is it kind of like the same thing? So, the 990 EZ mean when you're able to oh, submit that version versus the long form based on what you expect your income to be. So if you expect your income to be $50,000 or less in your first year, I believe it is, then you would submit your 990 EZ. You would get it back within like, let's say 30 to 45 days and you have your 501c3 status. Now, the long form is if you're expected to have more than that a dollar amount in grant funds, or let's say you have a donor or some organizations already have donors that are like ready and waiting to fund them once they get their 501c3, then you would do the long form. But either way, I don't, it's not really gonna affect your grants because what that does is the, that process will help you receive your 501c3 status. Now, let's say you did the easy form, you ended up making more than $50,000, fantastic. Um, what do you do now? You would report to the IRS that you ended up making more money than you had expected and with your accountant and then you should be good to go. So um, I think you're mentioning the 1023 easy and not the 990. They're talking about the 990 to file. Ah, uh, yes, I was talking about the 1023, yes. Oh, they said the 990. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. No, no, yeah, I was talking about the 1023 form. So the is 990. it the 990 oh, easy or a regular 990, the long form in order to get grants? What's the benefit? So either one, I think either one, I mean, I've seen both. I've seen both. When you do your 990N, it kind of it means that you've made less money, right? So your 990N is a little tiny form that you would submit if you made under that $50,000 versus your full 990. So the difference there, I think, would be that, um, you know, your income is less with a 990N. So you've made less money, let's so to speak. So you may be able to apply for less grants. Um, but most importantly with your 990 is that you, make sure you file every year and you have that available to you. There's also certain funders that will require at least three years of tax reporting, um, which can mean that you made a lot of money, means you made no money, it doesn't matter, but they're gonna require three years of tax reporting for your, you know, with your 990s before you can even apply. So that's gonna be kind of your, your differences. So really the important thing too, I think, is that you definitely submit your 990s every year and report, even if you haven't received any funding yet, that's okay. So go ahead and report with the IRS to make sure you're in compliance. Awesome, thank you. Um, so another great question. Um, so in terms of the scoring proposal, uh, do they bring in external reviewers for both federal, private, and corporate grants, or do they finally, or do they find that they mostly do that with one sector versus another? So I would say the most of government grants are going to have external reviewers if not all of them. Um, all the ones that I've worked on have had external reviewers. When it comes to foundation, I've seen both. I've seen some that are larger foundations that have external reviewers, but there's some mom and pop foundations that it's just their board of directors doing it. And then corporate, corporate, I think it's a little bit more on the private side. Not to say that they wouldn't bring an external reviewer in, but I think the external reviewers are more typical, definitely in government. In many foundations are probably less common in the corporate sector. See if there's any other questions that are popping up. 
Yes, there are a lot more. I was sifting okay. through on Go my for it. take your time. Um, so another question that we received earlier is that it seems that there's a trend for funders to emphasize evaluation. So i.e. outcomes um, and that sort of nature. Do you agree with this or would you say um, that that is not necessarily what happens um, maybe 10 out of 10 times? So I would say that, I mean, the evaluation perspective is important because we're going to founder funding foundations, let's say foundations are funders. They want to make sure that the money that they're providing to your nonprofit is going to a good cause and that you are improving whatever it is you say you're going to improve, right? Because it's an investment in a lot of ways, because there are many, many nonprofits. It was a statistic that I saw. There's something like 800,000 nonprofits that are available. I mean, there's quite a bit of nonprofits, right? Um, so they, these nonprofits are all, you know, applying to the grants and they are choosing, okay, we want to go versus A versus B. So the benefit of the evaluation piece is that it helps the funders to know what you're doing to make sure that the money is going to a good cause, that you're using the money to improve um, your program services, expanding services, helping the people in your community. So I think that there's, a, that's a very important piece to it is to make sure, because it's also checks and balances for yourself, you know, as a business owner, we sometimes have an idea that we think it's going to work, we run it, and maybe it doesn't work out so well. So the same thing with the nonprofit, you want to make sure the programs, services that you're offering to your community are helping to change their lives for the better. So the evaluation piece helps to helps to do that, helps to document that. Amazing. Um, so we do have a couple of other questions and we do have some time left. Um, so um, a viewer asked us, um, we, um, we are bringing grant writing in-house as opposed to employing someone externally. Should we ask for copies of the grants submitted from her or um, to the funders? So say it again, we're bringing in grants. Um, so it seems like this organization went ahead and they're keeping their grant writing in-house versus mm -hmm. hiring an external um, yeah. person. Um, so they're asking if they should ask for copies of the grants submitted directly from this person or should they reach wow. out directly when they've applied to these programs? So if it's, if you're saying, if, if I'm understanding correctly, so you're bringing in grant writers that have had, that I'm guessing have experience. Um, if you're wanting to see the applications, maybe they've submitted before, you have to ask them if they're able to show them to you. I mean, I think writing samples are appropriate. I've provided writing samples before. Um, so I would say that it's good to see their work, to see their quality of work. Things like that are important. Now, when it comes to seeing the full-on proposals, that's going to depend on what the previous client is comfortable with and what's public and what's not. Now, one thing that is interesting is there are some community grants. I'm going to give you an example here in Miami, Florida. Um, the Children's Trust, for example, is a very large funder that's here. Um, and you're actually able to request to see the approved proposals from years before. So whenever it's a government fund or a public fund, a lot of them are very open to sharing those proposals with you. And that kind of links back to one of the questions we had early on. Is reading grant proposals um, a good tool to learn about grants? And I think it is. If you can get access to it, then yeah, I think that's a great idea. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lorinda. Um, again, tuning out with these questions. They're they're very hard hitting, but we love them. We love these questions. Keep me on my toes. Yeah, being able to elaborate on the space. Um, so another question from a viewer. Um, what do you suggest new nonprofits do in order to obtain funding when a lot of funders require a track record? Or um, a lot of funders are also potentially moving to invite-only grant submissions. So what I would say is what's important in the beginning stage, it's definitely your hardest, right? Your first grant is your hardest one to get. So what I would say is definitely define your program, services, have all that information really solid. And then think about working with partner organizations. Maybe there's another organization in your community that does something similar and you can partner together on a grant. So that would be kind of like one of your first steps, I would say. Um, and then what was the second part of the question again? Oh, it was really just a one part question of like, what do you suggest that they do in order to obtain new funding? Just because sometimes they found um, that- uh, Invite only. Yes. I remember the invite only. That's what it was. Okay. So I have, a, I have a really good tip for you. Invite only means that, of course, they have to invite you in order for you to apply. But that does not mean that you can't reach out to them and provide them some educational materials 
or give them some tips and tricks or some information on the demographic that you serve. It also does not mean that you're not able to, let's say, invite them to one of your events or, or engage with them in other ways. You know, sometimes funders, and I found this um, working here in Miami with some of the local funders, is, is you know, they're people too, right? They want to know what you're doing. They would love to engage with you. You don't always have to reach out to them just to ask them for money, right? So you can reach out to them, say, hey, this is what we're doing in the community. This is a project that we have. We'd love for you to be involved. And sometimes that alone, that connection will help them get to know who you are. And then again, now you've prepped your documentation, you have your programs together, and that will lead towards an opportunity with working with them in the future. So that's what I would recommend that you do in the beginning. Beautiful tip. Um, okay, so we're gonna go with maybe one or two more questions um, before um, going back to kind of the GRR and Remy's Consulting and kind of what services we provide. Um, but going ahead with another question, how much time learned would you say that it takes to complete a grant submission? I know you love this question. So it takes a lot. So actually, there's that was one of the, um, it was a piece of data that I was thinking about putting in the presentation. I did not. There was a, there was a research study done by Candid. Candid is with Foundation Search. Um, they Foundation Center, they it's a really great website. They have lots of lots of information there. And they did a research study that said it can be anywhere from 40 to 100 hours of time prepping applications. Again, if it's a if it's a federal funder, it's significantly more. If it's let's say a foundation or corporate funder, it may be less. But what I can tell you from our professional experience is that again, harping back on what I was talking about before, if you can get all these documents together, get this information together, that's saving you 80% of your time. That way your grant activities are cut down to much less amount of time. So it really is a time kind of a time spend is trying to gather all these documentations, getting everything together, getting letters of support from partners, et cetera, when you have to do that on a deadline. That's where a lot of time is spent. But once you have everything kind of prepared, or at least again, like good 80, 60 to 80% of it prepared, that'll help speed your process quite a bit. Beautiful. Um, okay, so we're gonna go with another question. So are there any tips for USA nonprofits that offer services only to other countries? Real question. So um, two years ago, I think it was 2021 or 2022, we worked mostly in Latin America. So these were all US-based nonprofit organizations that serve overseas. What I would say is that the funders are different. So your funders that are gonna fund US-based, you know, with services here in the US are different than those that are funding international. So one of the things I would say is to look for funders that are funding internationally, start there, because it can be really um, difficult to, you know, if a foundation only wants to fund a program in the U.S., they may not fund international. So I would say start there. Then what I would say is, depending on the country of origin or the country you're serving, start looking to see what other NGOs or nonprofits are in that country. So you can start comparing services and maybe even partner with an organization outside of the country. But you need to get like, do like a little bit of a marketing, I would say like a marketing, I don't want to say competitor analysis because we're not competitors here. We're all working together, but see who else is providing services um, similar to yours in that country to see if you can partner together or at least learn what they're doing well. So you can see how you can complement each other. Oh, okay, so we are going to take one additional question, and then I believe we are going to just briefly discuss the GRR again, and kind of what services we provide. Um, so the last question that we're going to take right now, but don't worry, we're writing all of these questions down. They will not go unanswered. We will um, try to proactively maybe create a webinar in the future addressing all of these questions and discussing these topics a little bit further. Um, but this question, after not being selected for a grant, is there a way to obtain the winning grant proposal to review and use as a model to improve your writing? Absolutely love that question. And I would say sometimes yes. And if you can't do it, I would, you know, sometimes people feel rejected and it's understandable when you've, you know, been denied an application, but I find those to be some of the absolute best tools for improvement. You know, it's literally, it's one of the things that we request of clients. We don't want to see just we rewarded. We want to see what you were rejected because that way we can help to use, use that information to guide us to improve in the future. A lot of funders are open to sharing with you. If not, the other proposals maybe can give you guidance or support. Some foundations are willing to sit with you and have a call. I've been on many of them 
and talk to them. Don't be afraid of the funders. They're here to help us as well. Sometimes they're very inundated with information, with, with you know, a lot of things going on. They're not able to reach out to you, but do, but do it fearlessly. Respectfully request that information, that feedback from them. Um, all they can do is say no. But if they say yes, you're going to have a great tool to help you move forward. Beautiful. Okay, so I know we're at time. So, um, Lorinda, the last thing I'm going to kind of direct your way um, is essentially just kind of discussing in a nutshell, um, one more time, the GRR and essentially what services we provide, what the process kind of looks like. Um, nothing too in depth, because I know that in the chat, we've also included the link um, to TechSoup's website to go ahead and kind of look at the service a little bit further. But if you could just kind of let us know um, in your own words, like what is the GRR and what are we here to do and help um, these um, participants with? Absolutely. So very briefly, GRR is an opportunity for nonprofit maturities to submit all of these documentations that I mentioned before, all these checkpoints, all these things that our funders are looking for. We're providing you access to that framework. And it's an opportunity for you to build out these documents because there's also support materials on how to do that and submit them into a secure portal where our team of grant writers, ex-funders, and nonprofit specialists are going to review that. We're going to score your document as if it was an actual grant. And you're going to get a finalized report that's going to show you exactly the areas that you need to improve. And it's going to give you a score. You're 80% grant ready. You're 10% grant ready. And we're going to give you the guidance to make sure that you're grant ready. Because what we found is, and what I found in my career, is that it's so much, there's so much um, help that organizations need in that space. And if you can get yourself grant ready, the rest of the process is much easier. So that's how we're going to serve you through the GRR. Perfect. So just to reiterate, um, because I know it was another question in the chat, um, essentially what the GRR you're saying does is kind of get you ready, get you organized, give you that structure, that, you know, preparedness that you need and essentially also provide that scoring feature um, that some fun, um, some nonprofits may not be aware of, um, you know, of what goes into that scoring process. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds, correct? Exactly. Yep. Both sides. Amazing. Well, um, like I mentioned before, I know there are a million and one questions. Everyone, um, you know, has asked wonderful questions so far. Um, our team has made sure to kind of um, write these down and and go ahead and potentially create another webinar in the future addressing all of these questions, discussing all of these topics. Um, but you can always find more information directly on the link that was kind of um, surfaced in the chat uh, during the presentation um, on TechSoup's website about what the GRR is and what it provides. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for all of your questions and for being so curious. We, we love that. We love an active audience. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. And thanks again to TechSoup as well for giving us the opportunity to chat. I hope we can see you again soon in a future webinar.